For 18 young Caribbean athletes, it began with a choice. It became the decision that would define their lives. 30 years later, the repercussions remain. A period of darkness in the shining history of West Indies cricket. And each man forever branded a rebel. Cricket means the life, blood and soul of the West Indies. I love cricket. We used to play cricket when we left on vacation from morning until evening. From the time I was small, I always dreamed that to play for the West Indies. West Indies, the heart and soul of all of us, is unite us, bring all of us together. With the arrival of British colonists to the Caribbean in the 18th century came the game of cricket. Elegant, poetic, strategic. The sport was soon picked up and perfected by the Caribbean people. I would say that um, West Indian people have made the greatest single uh, cultural investment in the game of cricket. And it has to do with uh, how West Indian society evolved uh, after 1838, when the slavery system is, is abolished. The group of Caribbean islands known as the West Indies put together a team to compete internationally. Their first official test took place in England in 1928. And for the next two decades, the team was always captained by a white player, even if he wasn't the most talented man on the team. But in 1948, more than 200 years after the sport came to the region, the West Indies appointed its first black captain, George Headley. On the field of play, irrespective of what is taking place beyond the boundary, within the boundary, there is a level playing field. Uh, there is social justice, there is mutual respect, there's mutual admiration. And within the context of the game, that value system was what the society wanted to see in all other areas of life. Across the Atlantic, 1948 was a landmark year for South Africa too, but in a very different way. It was the official beginning of apartheid. With its roots in South Africa's colonial past, apartheid is an Afrikaans word meaning separation. And when the policy of racial segregation became law after the National Party won the 48 election, South Africa was separated into the ruling white minority and the oppressed non-white majority. Every facet of life was split. Separate areas for the different racial classifications were designated on everything from buses and trains, cities to townships, even park benches and public beaches. Downgraded as citizens and as human beings, the non-white population began to protest the apartheid government. What began with peaceful demonstrations quickly escalated into violent retribution as the government tried to contain and control the opposition. Young leaders like Nelson Mandela were jailed, and thousands of other protesters were arrested and killed. But what the apartheid government couldn't suppress were the shocking images being played out to the rest of the world. It is very racist. You should never be treated because of your, your color, or badly, or, you know. And I was very, very disturbed when you, see, you saw quite a lot of things in television. I didn't know much about apartheid. I just knew that obviously it was white people in a black country as we saw it not so much imprisoning him, but totally 
ostracizing black people and having the run of everything. To pressure South Africa's leaders, worldwide sanctions were applied. South Africa's sporting fate was sealed when Prime Minister John Fuster banned mixed competition between whites and non-whites, effectively linking sport and politics. It was just entwined in South Africa. That was, those were the rules and you couldn't do anything about it. It was uh, very police oriented and controlled and secured and, and you, you had to toe the line. In 1970, the International Cricket Council, the world's governing body for the sport, shut down South African cricket. No longer could South Africa's national team compete on the world stage. Unable to play together as a team, South Africa's frustrated cricketers sought individual opportunities overseas. But wherever they went, the fallout of their government's domestic policies followed. It was inevitable that something had to happen. You were taking on the world. We, I mean, there were sanctions in every capacity. When you were travelling overseas as a South African, you were a bit loath to tell everybody you were from South Africa because they would nail you. Overseas, white South African cricketers played side by side with black players from the West Indies, England and Australia. They were teammates and friends all the while knowing that they couldn't play with or against talented black South African cricketers back home in their own country. That was how stupid it all was and the illogical thinking that was going on at the time. And you know, here we go and play overseas with and against all of them. Now, have we come back with some disease or virus or whatever? No, we haven't and that's how stupid it was. In fact, it ended up in 1971, we had a walk-off. The players got together and it was 10 years of the Republic and we decided as players that we wanted to be heard. So we had a walk-off in Cape Town. We got badly castigated by the, the nationalist government and all the press and that we must stick to cricket and what did we know about politics. The government ignored the players' protests. With apartheid still in place, the ICC's ban on the national team stretched to one year, then two, then 10, eventually becoming a 22-year period of isolation that deprived the nation's cricket-mad fans of the sport they loved and their cricketers of the careers they dreamed of. Well, it was desperate, we had anticipated, but I think the hardest thing was to, to know how long it was gonna go on for, to try and plan your future life. It went on for a long time. By that time, it was too late for me to make a change. You were always optimistic. I've always been optimistic that you'd have a chance of playing. You know, this, the stupidity that existed would change and South Africa would change uh, much quicker and we'd be back playing uh, international sport. But uh, it hung on and hung on and hung on. By the late 1970s, they were desperate. The worldwide sanctions were working. And to save cricket in South Africa, the sports administrators knew they had to do something to keep the sport relevant. And so, shrouded in secrecy, they began planning Rebel Tours, unofficial tournaments with cricket teams from various countries. Their ultimate target, a team of players from the era's best cricketing region in the world, the West Indies. Caribbean. Its pristine beaches and palm trees, a paradise for millions of visitors every year and for the people who live there. Across the different Caribbean nations that make up what is known as the West Indies, there is one unifying passion. Cricket. Current and former players are viewed as heroes, enshrined in museums, immortalized as statues. They knew from the early stage that um, cricket, watching Sagari Sobers and Rohan and I, and them, I always had, I knew that I was going to play for the West Indies. From the time I grew up, I said I wanted to play cricket for the West Indies. And... When the West Indies team did well, 
the West Indian people felt proud and, you know, they walked with a little, there was spring, they stepped. Through the 1950s and 60s, the West Indies rose to prominence, producing world-famous cricketers like Sir Gary Sobers, Everton Weeks and Frank Worrell. When it became Clive Lloyd's team in 1974, the new captain realised it was a huge responsibility. I remember a guy telling me that, you know, being captain of the West Indies team, you're more important than any one prime minister. And I said, really? He said, yes, because the prime minister of Jamaica, he's the only prime minister of Jamaica. Or the Barbados prime minister, you know, he's prime minister of Barbados. But you, as captain of the West Indies team, you're playing for everybody. As captain, Lloyd put the West Indies on the map. And soon, they were champions of the first ever Cricket World Cup in 1975. When we have won the World Cup, you, you, you're in the first World Cup, you're never going to get another first. So this was a landmark situation. And when we got back home, the people were lining the streets. And you know, those are moments that you don't forget. You hold them dear. They followed with a repeat performance in the 1979 World Cup. Thanks to the brilliant and slightly unexpected batting heroics of Collis King from Barbados. Sometimes you know when it's going to be your day. I just knew from the time I struck the first ball, I knew it was going to be my day. I just knew it. You know, the, when, I, when I walked back in after I got out, so many people there, white, black, blue, pink, just stood and it brought water to my eyes, I tell you. In the late 1970s and into the 80s, the Caribbean and its cricketers were on top of the world. Overflowing with talent, the West Indies had enough players to field at least two world-class teams. Yet with all the hype and success, the money didn't follow. The small amount they were paid to represent the West Indies internationally and to play club cricket at home was not enough to earn a living. They were playing more for the countries than they were playing for their own benefit. Obviously, they would have enjoyed the adulation, feeling themselves on a pedestal, and the hero worship, etc. But in terms of the remuneration and being able to, to enjoy luxuries of life, um, it was not there. Back in apartheid South Africa, the national cricket team remained isolated from international competition. The South African Cricket Union didn't have many options, but it did have money. We were isolated at the time. We had very good cricketers. We wanted, to, we wanted our cricketers to have the opportunity of playing against internationals. The idea for Rebel Tours unofficial cricket tournaments was taking shape. Joe Pemensky, along with fellow SACU member Ali Barker, were planning a bold move to defy the International Cricket Council. From our point of view, we knew that we had the best cricketers in the world, and we wanted to show them off to the world that they would see it the same way as we saw it. The South Africans were offering huge financial rewards, enough to lure teams into a country ruled by a brutal and oppressive apartheid regime, condemned by the rest of the world. In March of 1982, England became the first rebel team to arrive in Johannesburg. We brought out the Graham Gooch's team previously from England with quite a few of the prominent England players at the time. And we wanted to follow it up. We wanted to give our public the opportunity of, first of all, seeing international cricketers uh, in our own uh, country as well as our own players having the opportunity to play against them as a team. Later that year, a team from Sri Lanka followed, and it wasn't long before attention turned to the best cricketing region in the world, the West Indies. You heard a lot of whispers around the place that perhaps these fellows were going to go to South Africa. You saw um, officials of the South African administration, uh, people like Joe Pomensky and Ali Baka, they were around, so you felt that maybe they were there for a purpose. But at that time, you really couldn't believe they could assemble a West Indies team, given the whole background to the anti-apartheid movement. You know, it was always somebody around asking you a question like, if you were offered a contract to go to South Africa, would you go? 
and they had to ask everybody that, just like testing the water to see if they can really get a consensus of players together to go. It sparked a fevered debate across the Caribbean. The financial offers were more than most of the players would ever see in their lifetimes, estimated to be worth between 100 and 150,000 US dollars per man. But for a region not far removed from its own oppressive colonial past, the players struggled with one question. Was any amount worth the cost of going to South Africa during apartheid? By the end of 1982, South Africa's national cricket team had been banned from international competition for more than a decade. The government continued its violent crackdowns on internal opposition to its apartheid laws. While the South African Cricket Union, or SACU, headed by Joe Pemensky, desperately searched for ways to keep the sport alive. With two rebel tours already now complete, Pemensky set his sights on the world champion West Indies. Everybody knew of the great West Indian cricketers of the past, and they admired them terribly when they went to Australia and beat Australia in Australia. And uh, So uh, it was something that the cricket supporters in South Africa were anxious uh, to see for themselves. He enlisted Gregory Armstrong, a cricketer from Barbados, to negotiate lucrative contracts with other Caribbean players. I was in Australia at the time. Communication, myself and Pominsky and Ali Baker, Gregory Armstrong, we um, communicated. Firstly, they wanted the main team. All the boys, everybody had a contract, but some declined not to go. And they came and saw me in the middle of the afternoon, for instance, and had a long chat, and they're pleading with me, and I said, you know, it's all fine, and I wish the guys all well, but I, I don't think I'll go. I won't be going. Five o'clock next morning, there's a knock on my door, and I'm back up there and I said, no, 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 thank you very much, but wish the guys well. In my situation, there, there is over a million or um, more, so I would have been a very rich, rich guy, but um, we found a lot of money, and um, I, I, just, I just didn't want to. I didn't want to do that, and I couldn't. And I'm proud of, proud of who I am and uh, my, my color, you know. And I, I think that um, everybody should be proud of who they are. But I don't think that it's very demeaning. Um, apartheid was not a system that should happen anywhere in the world. And I, I, all the money in the world wouldn't, you know, um, couldn't get me there. Besides team captain Clive Lloyd, other West Indies stars were outspoken in their opposition to the South African tour. The future captain, Viv Richards, called the offer blood money. But other players were tempted, even though agreeing to play in South Africa would be risky. The first touring side from England was banned from cricket for three years. Sri Lanka's rebel players banned for 25 years. To get the West Indies players to agree, South Africa would have to make the risk worthwhile. We made an offer, candidly, that they couldn't refuse. And uh, it turned out to be just that. Without Clive Lloyd, the team would need another captain. That man turned out to be Lawrence Rowe, a Jamaican cricket hero. Joining him, other established players like Colin Croft and Sylvester Clark one of the most feared of the West Indies fast bowlers. I wouldn't call them second raters. They were the replacements. They were the players who were going to sustain that great team. These were the players that we had invested in and were next in line to sustain West Indian excellence and dominance of the game for another decade. Also agreeing to go, David Murray, one of the best wicket keepers in the game and Collis King, hero of the 1979 World Cup. I know that um, at the time, going to South Africa, I made the decision because I wasn't getting treated right as far as wrestling is concerned. I was still scoring runs, but yeah, I wasn't a team. You know, and I said to myself, well, quit is my job. You're not picking me. I go to play cricket. It's a place where people will, you know, see, see proper cricket, and that, that's why I went. 
But not all the potential players were as certain in their decision. The negotiations lasted for months. Players would agree, then change their minds. And even those who knew they were going, denied it. No, no, nobody knew. We knew that we were going, right? Um, the press just got rid of it, um, and they were at my house, and, you know, and I said, oh, what are you talking about? The critical feature of that moment was the constant trail of denials. Names were being called. Players' names were appearing in the newspapers as persons who had agreed to participate in these tours. Now, the significance of these denials, one could say, is uh, embedded in the fact that there was something unethical and moral not quite right about it. It could be, and some have argued, that the contractual arrangements were not yet finalized. But I think the public opinion was so much against the possibility of that development that players found themselves, when their names were called, uh, in a state of denial. In fact, uh, players were in a state of denial up until the moment they got on the plane. Lookers in the arrival hall awaited the six Barbadian cricketers who defied the Barbados Cricket Association, the West Indies Cricket Board of Control, the Barbados government's stand, and other official policy to play in racist South Africa. First to arrive was all-rounder Collis King. He covered his face as he walked towards the emigration counter, but later forced to smile as some fans shouted abuse while others hurled shouts of support. Most Caribbean broadcasters and news outlets boycotted the tour. But in Barbados, the head of the newspaper The Nation told journalist Al Jilks to pack his bags. With 10 of the 18 rebels from the island of Barbados alone, this story was bigger than cricket and one they couldn't afford to miss out on. I was very, very not excited. Um, I was scared. I was re relatively scared um, about the unknown that was apartheid. You had heard so many stories, you've heard about people being killed, you've seen images of school kids being mowed down by, by police and dogs and what all the case may be. So I was scared going to South Africa as a black man because I didn't know what to expect. Meanwhile, the 23-year-old Franklin Stevenson a rising star with a promising career ahead of him had repeatedly turned down offers to go to South Africa. But the day the team left, he had a change of heart. But I knew that the tour was more important than being just cricket. And I thought, you know what, I'm, I need to go on this tour. And I believe that cricket can make a difference and I'm going to be part of that team. By the time Stevenson met up with the team, some of the players were having second thoughts. On the plane, we had two guys that actually changed their minds. They were adamant. It was like, I'm going to go knock on this door and tell this guy to turn back. You know, we don't want to go anymore. Once aboard Eastern's Flight 974, bound for Miami, it was cleared to leave. But it was too late. The team was on a plane bound for South Africa to face apartheid head on. In January of 1983, 18 young black athletes from a group of Caribbean islands arrived in South Africa. The West Indies players were in the heart of apartheid, and just by stepping onto South African soil, they had become rebels. When they got to South Africa, I realized that separation, and it wasn't only black and white. It's not only uh, the color of your skin, but it's the language that you speak, it's the area that you live in, you know, and it's what you were allowed to do and we're going so and so. The divisions were very, very real when we got there. After months of secret negotiations, denials and decisions, South African Cricket Union President Joe Pomensky finally had the marquee team he was hoping for. He also knew what they were risking to be there. We arranged with the Department of Internal Affairs that the, the, the passports wouldn't be stamped to indicate that they'd been to visit South Africa because it was a problem for them internationally. Well, I was sort of told the day before that, they were, that the team was arriving 
but it had to be like that. If uh, anyone had got wind of it, they would have been uh, stopped from actually coming before they even got to the, to the borders. I was transfixed. I couldn't really understand what I was seeing. I saw there were a lot, a lot of black people walking in the street, but they seemed to be walking almost like close to the gutter. Nobody's making eye contact with anybody, and their heads are down in the gutter, and they're, they're scurrying. And I'm just trying to figure it out because in my neck of the woods, you know, our people are, you know, bolsterous, they're, you know, friendly, they're, and it looks so different. Unsure of how they would be received by the country's mainly white cricket fan base, the West Indies Rebels prepared for their first test match. But they soon realized they had little to worry about. In droves, crowds, mainly white crowds, came to see the legendary West Indies cricketers. Oh yeah, we packed them in, right? We packed them in. We turned about actually about 16 to 20,000 at Pretoria, the heart of apartheid. And the, the Ali Baka, the um, director at the time, he, um, he actually cried the evening and said, you all have made it here. But you could turn about 20,000 in the heart of apartheid. Well, the West Indies were, were highly regarded. They had most attractive players. Uh, and, and we thought it, it could also assist us, because at that stage, we were very, very keen to expand the playing of cricket amongst the, what was at that stage seen as the underprivileged community in South Africa. Here was a country in which no black man had ever seen a black person in competition with a white person. A black team playing against a white team and beating them. And to me, that was where the real victory was. To this day, Jilks and the players maintain that something more important than just cricket took place on that tour. An eye-opening experience for a society of white fans raised under apartheid now cheering on a black team. They had a huge following in terms of their uh, being heroes of so-called white South Africans who now weren't meant to be supporting them. And uh, they created it because that respect was earned. White kids who would have grown up in houses in which the only contact with blacks would have been with their nannies and their gardeners and at the end of the day, they were given to, 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 to see them as being inferior beings, or even being animals, as opposed to being equals. And then to see these kids in the hundreds and the thousands, I mean, idolizing these black boys from the Caribbean, running them down, begging for autographs. Franklin Stevenson taking some time off to sign an autograph. Immensely popular group of fellows. I remember the first game we played in Cape Town. And I was on the boundary. I walked in, the ball was bowled. I walked back. This little kid ran out to me, little white kid ran out to me. And he said, sir, have some of my Coke. So I said, thank you, but I have enough drinks here on the boundary. Thank you very much, right? I walked back, he ran to me, sir, have some of my Coke. I said, this isn't going right. OK, so I took his bottle of Coke, one of those pet bottles, and I went, are you happy? Yeah! And he ran off the field. The next ball, when I walked back, there were about 15 little kids. Seriously, I was on my coke, you know? And I think that really got our guys to really come off the ladder and think, you know, maybe this isn't too bad, you know, because the people really loved, just to love what they saw. I believe that those kids were genuine. Those kids, they saw, they didn't see color, right? They saw people who were superior in terms of their art, in terms of their sport and talent, and their idolizing for that, and I believe that they would have grown up having a different respect for black people than they would have had, had it not been for that experience. But critics of the tour have never bought that argument. Instead of helping to end apartheid, they say the rebel tours strengthened and supported it. Even within South Africa itself, some non-white groups organized protests against the tour. 
you're disappointed in what they did because I don't think they were going to make a difference. You know, they weren't going to make a difference. They were going for the money and they should said, right, we're going for the money and plain and simple and that's it. But don't tell me that you're going to change the, the apartheid system. You went there because you wanted, you were looking after your family and there was money there. Certain members of the public were opposed to us creating an atmosphere of our getting together because they wanted the politics to, go, to come first before the sport. We felt that the sport could be a catalyst to facilitate the politics taking place as well. But the politics and the sport couldn't be separated. In order for 18 black men to travel freely around apartheid South Africa, special arrangements had to be made. And so, the players were given a unique status and made honorary whites. I think it's a difficult thing is that you're respectful for them coming out here, but they're living as temporary people in the country. That is, they're allowed to do things that wasn't part of the country because they're doing you a favor. You know, they could come and go in, in their own time and wherever they wanted to go, where, which wasn't the policy. With the label honorary whites, the black West Indies players enjoyed preferential treatment. They could stay in better hotels, could frequent regular bars, and go to places normally designated as whites only. It's something that really got under your skin, you know, and then but we never, I never came across it personally to say that, uh, excuse me, stop the show, but this is an honorary white coming here, you've got to let him in, you know. But uh, it was just a, another term for people who wanted to be derogatory to, to label us. Of all the criticisms surrounding the West Indies' participation in the Rebel Tours, this sparked the most outrage. The players maintain that they still saw the real South Africa, but their critics say the players were shielded from the reality of life under apartheid law for the millions of people classified as non-whites. Even so, the title of honorary white couldn't protect the players from everything. Colin Croft was taken off a train because he had gone into the white section and had forgotten for a moment that as an honorary white in South Africa, not everyone uh, in the society understood the, the concept of honorary white. Now that story cut through Caribbean society that the people of the region had fought so hard for independence, uh, against colonization, they had fought against slavery, and here we had a West Indian star go into Southern Africa as an honorary white to play cricket and being humiliated. I think his humiliation was felt as a Caribbean humiliation. As the month-long tour came to an end, the West Indies rebels were increasingly aware of the anger facing them back home. They were more fearful of returned to the Caribbean than they were of going into South Africa. They felt more dread in facing that from their own people than they felt in facing what the unknown of playing in an apartheid situation conditions. They may have won over the hearts of the fans in South Africa, but they were about to lose everything. In 1983, the month-long rebel tour between South Africa and the West Indies ended in a draw. A moral victory in segregated South Africa, a black team equal with a white one. But the rest of their world didn't see it that way. As the West Indies players prepared to return to the Caribbean, they knew they had to face serious repercussions. People would not allow them to be themselves to be seen other than those guys who were labeled as having gone into South Africa as honorary white people in order to go to South Africa. And I felt sorry for them because I knew that they would never outlive what they were returned to. The majority of the West Indies public did not sympathize with the players. A deep sense of betrayal cut through the Caribbean. These cricketers that they'd once idolized were now disgraced, viewed as sellouts. And if we are to maintain our dignity as a people, 
We must never in any way appear to condone the policies of apartheid in South Africa or any other practices which offend the dignity of our people. There is no price for which self-respect or human integrity can ever be bought. That view was reflected by officials right across the West Indies. But for the players' careers, the only opinion that really mattered was that of the West Indies Cricket Board of Control. These players have unwittingly advanced the cause of apartheid. They have been blinded by the inducement of money, not realizing the real and the full implications. Those players will not be eligible to play in any matches under the auspices of the West Indies Cricket Board of Control. The board decided on the harshest penalty that any of the rebel teams had seen yet, a lifetime ban from West Indies cricket. Some of the sport's best players would never represent their countries again. Not a life ban. Because you'd be taking away the cricket team then, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's harsh. England had been to South Africa on a tour, English test team, a lot of players left, and they were banned for three years. Australia went on a tour of South Africa, and they were banned for two years. I know that uh, Sri Lanka had a team go on tour, and they were considered they were banned for 25 years. And our guys here considered and decided that uh, they were, had to be the most militant, and they're going to show the world how decisive they can be, and so they decided that we'd be banned for life. And there were even uh, statements that uh, we should be ostracized, not allowed to re-enter our communities, you know. I remember going to Trinidad a few years later and there wasn't allowed entry. I went to Jamaica to play golf and they wouldn't allow me to play. They never anticipated that um, there'd be so much venom um, being poured out against them. They heard that they had been banned for life. I guess that was the a really hard blow to all of them. Lifetime ban is, is a bit harsh. It just showed you how strong people were in going to South Africa at that time. To escape the anger and the disappointment, many players felt they had no choice but to leave their home countries and live abroad. These players came home with money, a substantial amount of money, but they return to a society that for them was like a morgue. They were shunned in their villages and their towns, could not put together a network of, of friends to sit and socialize with them. There was a sense of, of isolation. That isolation still largely exists today, 30 years later. Players still resented, still unforgiven. It wasn't easy, but people had been, felt that they shouldn't even go on, you know, but um, up to now they still um, see that. He's, um, he played in a rebel, he's a rebel who played in South Africa. Others did, but I don't think they get the same attention that I do. In, up to now it is, um, People don't forget it. Although the gates is open, they're playing, you know what I mean? They don't forget it. Here we are reflecting upon this, you know, 30 years later. There is a view that many of these players descended into socially destructive behavior. Many of them develop a lifestyle in the despair of the isolation um, and became addicted to drugs alcohol. Uh, some of these stories are very sad stories. In Barbados, David Murray, once a star, now drifting. In the years after the tour, Murray lost more than just his career. His family, his wife, his daughter, born while he was in South Africa. Living in Australia at the time, he and his wife faced being deported for his role in the rebel tours. They were unwelcome in the West Indies, unwanted in Australia, with a newborn and facing the possibility 
of nowhere to go. They didn't want me to return. Politi politics got into it. You say you're unemployed now and life is a struggle. Do you think that situation is as a result of the most decision likely, to go? Most likely also, most likely. In Jamaica, team captain Lawrence Rowe bore the brunt of the criticism. Facing relentless backlash, he felt that he had no choice but to move to the United States. Once a national hero, he too was now unwelcome in his own country. And he's still feeling it to this day. Um, he will never live in Jamaica again. In 2011, Jamaican officials seemingly had a change of heart, deciding to name one of the stands in the Sabina Park Stadium after him. But the public outcry was so intense, even now, that the decision was reversed and his name removed. For Rowe, it brought back the painful memories of his treatment since 1983. He declined to be interviewed for this program. And he wasn't the only one. I think they're trying to forget it. Um, not the tour itself, but they're trying to forget the hurt and pain they would have been exposed to on the return. I went there as a cricketer. Yes, obviously you can get paid. Right? But a lot of people say from a different point of view, in order to the comment that they, they talk, I said, do not talk when you don't know. You know, but yet they will come to me and say, I'm not here to give you information on situations. I said, go and see for yourself. Today, Collis King is 61 years old. He still plays cricket every chance he gets, including a senior league in the United Kingdom where he spends much of his time. And on a recent trip back home to Barbados, he captained a team in a charity match. But beneath the surface, the bitterness of the past 30 years remains. This probably is the first time that, you know, I've heard my views concerning South Africa, you know, because nobody never come and said to me, what's your, what's your story, what's your side of the story, you know? People just point at you and said, you do this and do that. I said, you wait. We talk. I've been, I've seen. For a group of men who lived for their sport, the penalty of going to apartheid South Africa was a lifetime ban from international cricket. The ban was eventually lifted in 1989, but by then, the damage had been done. Most of the West Indies rebels were past their prime. I knew that they had gone to South Africa out of the need to have some substance, because some of them had, were has-beens, others were would-have-beens, but now the has-beens were gone and the would have beans would never be. But it wasn't just the West Indies cricketers whose careers were cut short by apartheid. In South Africa, Clive Rice was young and talented, primed for a long and successful career. After 22 years of isolation, he too never played an official test match. We're definitely the wrong side of history if you had to say, do you want to have been born uh, in 49, or do you want to be born now with what's going on? There's not even a debate. If you want to have it uh, be born now and playing today, where the players today don't even understand uh, what was going on with uh, when we were playing. And for Graham Pollock, one of the best ever to play the game, another career cut short. His full potential never realised, blanketed, by the ban. But one, he says, was necessary for the future of his country. It meant that personally I was going to be affected by a career, but if I looked in my family and the long term for, for people to survive, it had to happen. I just feel sorry for the guys that didn't get an opportunity. In 1990, the last rebel tour was set to take place in South Africa. An all-white English side led by Mike Gatting 
was ready to play its second tour. But an outburst of protests from non-white South Africans forced the organizers to call it off. Shortly after, apartheid itself was officially disbanded, less than a decade after the first West Indies tour. I believe to this day that that tour played a very significant role in the acceptance that 10 years afterward that white South Africans had to have dismantled apartheid and to be in a situation where they could accept that black people are equal. These are people who genuinely want change because they didn't have to invite us. They can keep inviting the white teams or whatever or just play among themselves, but they wanted to invite us because they want, they foresee this change too. And we go there and the cost of that is to be banned for life. No, it's totally wrong. So that's, that, that was a shame and a pity of it. Today, Franklin Stevenson is widely regarded as the best never to have played for the West Indies. Welcome to the Franklin Stevenson Academy. <laughs> he is now a golf instructor at a country club in Barbados. But he still finds a way to connect with his first love at the Youth Cricket and Golf Academy he founded near his home. At the academy, a photo of his rebel team sits proudly on the shelf. He even still has his tour blazer from 1983. Some of the players have lost or sold theirs, but Stevenson treasures it. I think it probably is worth most to me <laughs> in that nobody looks back on the tour. I don't get anybody looking back on the tour saying uh, it liberated them in a sense in the Caribbean anyway. There was a lot of negative press and negative feeling about it initially, and that was allowed to fester. And nobody looked back at it or looked out for us. Many of them were destroyed as cricketers. I mean, it is true that a few of them were eventually rehabilitated, but the majority of them were removed from consideration. Their cricket careers came to an end. Three decades later, the rebel players are still paying the price. Their lives shaped by one decision made as young men, motivated by money and maybe the chance to do something bigger than cricket. Yeah, no regrets. You made the decision, so you, you stick by it. Decide that you're going to be banned for life and you can play locally in different pastures and fields wherever you may say. So that's it. If I had to do it all over again, I would do it. You don't do, sorry is a word that sometimes don't come easy. I'm not sorry about going to South Africa. People come back and apologize. I have none to apologize for. Some people have forgiven them, um, but I don't, think, I don't think all of them. Because people see that that was a, 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 you know, a, great, a, a moment in history where you, we had to stand out and try and fight for a cause. And um, they, they think a lot about the sports of sportsmen and they think that they, they should have, um, you know, they should have held out. To this day, we have not had a healing of that wound. Over 60 years of cricket icons, you have a certain dignity and a prestige and a heroism, but there's that layer in between of that rebel tour drugs, alcohol, isolation, social abuse. It really is a very sad moment. I'll sing you a song. I'll tell you of the cricket match and of the men who played in Johannesburg in 1983. The tour started in which the guys were seen as mercenaries. But as far as we're concerned, I saw them as missionaries who converted white South Africans to accepting that blacks were the equals and even better. Springboks and West Indies came at last to test their strength in a match that will go down in history. I know I went there as a missionary, I, you know. I went and I carried the whole of the Caribbean people 
You know, a lot of people didn't like us going there. What? We went there and come on, skiff. To face the mighty box of ours and everyone agrees. West Indies should have been here years ago. We were sportsmen, professional sportsmen, professional cricketers. I don't see the, um, the mercenary part of it or whatever. We were just professional cricketers. So you got to do your work, you know, you have your work to do. So blow them away, Windies, blow them away. West Indies, blow bad memories away. Just give us cricket in the sun, lots of bumpers, lots of runs. Very soon we'll blow this away. <laughs> mercenaries. <laughs> what do mercenaries do? They go and fight somebody else's cause? Well, yes, I was a mercenary for black people's cause because wherever I've been, I've been an ambassador for my country, my race, and the game of cricket. You know, so if that's being mercenary, then yes, I was. <laughs> <laughs>